Good evening. I'd like to spend some time talking to you tonight about young adults and when to refer them for immunology evaluation. Over the next 40 minutes or so, I will describe an overall approach to consideration of primary immunodeficiency in young adults. And I will describe the distinct features of adult primary immunodeficiency from more common pediatric presentations. As we all know, primary immunodeficiency comprises a, a wide range of different inborn errors and acquired errors of primary immunodeficiency. These can affect the humoral components, the T cell or cellular components, as well as the innate forms of the immune system, um, including complement, our TLRs, and some of the more uh, innate cells, such as our NK cells, our neutrophils, uh, and others. As we also know, the majority of primary immunodeficiencies that we see really affect humoral immunity, um, either predominantly antibody deficiencies or those that affect cellular and humoral immunity or combined immunodeficiencies with associated syndromic um, features. You can see that that comprises about 65% of all primary immunodeficiencies. The incidence of primary immunodeficiency has increased during the last decade. Using the United States as a population-based cohort, primary immunodeficiency rates have increased from about 2.1 per 100,000 person years in the late 1970s into the early 80s to now about 10.3 per 100,000 person years in the early 2000s. Also, initial studies reported that the male to female ratio for patients affected by primary immunodeficiency was two to one to 1.4 to one, but that ratio again in that more recent cohort from the United States was closer to one to one. And this may reflect the changing genetic patterns of more novel autosomal recessive disease states that we've discovered in recent years. So what do we know about primary immunodeficiency and the genetics? Well, as you can see here, we know that in the last 10 years, there's been this very steep incline in the number of monogenic forms of primary immunodeficiency identified. But this doesn't take away from the fact that this is still a clinical diagnosis. And there are very important questions that we need to ask our patients before just jumping to a broad-based panel or exome sequencing. Is the main concern for the patient infection or immune dysregulation? If it's infection, what kind of infections are we seeing? Viral, fungal, bacterial, mycobacterial, or a mixture of some of all of these? If the patient has immune dysregulation, are the features autoantibody driven? Is it lymphoproliferation? Is it granulomatous disease? Or is it severe atopy or some mix of all of these? Do you have any laboratory studies already that might help point toward a category of defects? I always remind the fellows that we work with to keep a close eye on that total protein to albumin ratio. First of all, your albumin can guide if there's a secondary immunodeficiency that might be causing the patient's syndrome. And if you see a condensed total protein to albumin ratio, that might indicate poor production of immunoglobulin, especially in the setting of normal albumin. Similarly, if you look at the CBC, make sure you pay close attention to all the cell lines. Look at the absolute neutrophil count, the absolute lymphocyte count, the absolute eosinophil count, as well as what do those um, platelets look like and what size are they? Those things may help you with your differential diagnosis. Are there any somatic features that the patient has, like short stature, microcephaly, or poor wound healing? Is there a family history of malignancy, infection, autoimmunity? And are the exposures that they've had unusual? We can use all these questions to help us in both pediatric and adult patients. But some may question, when do we really see immunodeficiency diagnosed most commonly? So when in life do we find it? So while it's important to realize this data that I'm showing you is almost 10 years old, and it's prior to the onset of newborn screening, it is still notable that a sizable proportion of primary immunodeficiency patients are diagnosed in adulthood. 69%, in fact, of all new worldwide primary immunodeficiency cases 
are diagnosed in people who are more than 15 years of age and 50% over 25 years of age. Moreover, in a telephone survey, again, being a little biased toward looking in the US, um, a telephone survey of American households, it was found that of patients who were living with primary immunodeficiency, more than half of them were over 18 years of age. To give some hard fact type data, at a large Canadian referral center of 181 adult patients referred over a 10 year period, more than half of them were found to have a primary immunodeficiency. This was repeated in the US at a large primary immunodeficiency referral center on the East Coast, where there were 237 patients of all ages referred and 113 of them. So still uh, almost 50% were diagnosed with a primary immunodeficiency. And within that group, the mean age of diagnosis was 31 years of age. Also, primary immunodeficiency has been shown to exist in elderly populations, as well as, in, uh, as younger adult populations. So which kind of diseases do we wanna keep in mind when we think about young adults? Well, as you can see in this slide, the most common primary immunodeficiencies diagnosed in a younger adult time period are late onset combined immunodeficiencies, common variable immunodeficiency, and selective ID, IgA deficiency. GATA2 deficiency kind of reaches its peak closer to about 30 years of age, and idiopathic CD4 lymphopenia tends to reach its peak between 30 to 40 years of age while good syndrome is more commonly diagnosed in patients in late middle age. We also see a good number of patients with complement deficiency diagnosed in their late teens to early 20s. And so I'll also focus on this diagnosis today. So a primary immunodeficiency where the symptoms develop after normal childhood is not uncommon. Um, in, in those patients with um, these antibody deficiencies, the patients may have cellular immunity defects as well, and they may present not just with infection, but with symptoms of dysregulation, and it's important to keep this in mind. Conversely, you can have patients who are seen in an adult clinic, but have had an extremely complex childhood presentation, and not necessarily have a lot of infections during childhood, but they have complex combinations of failure to thrive, chronic diarrhea, nonspecific dermatitis, autoimmune manifestations, or other congenital defects. And therefore, it may lead to primary immunodeficiency not being thought of right away in terms of the differential diagnosis for these patients. And so they can find their, themselves in young adulthood without a unifying uh, diagnosis. So what are some red flags? What are some things that can, we can use to help us identify these adult patients? So we're all familiar with the 10 warning signs for primary immunodeficiency. Four or more new ear infections within a year, two or more serious sinus infections within a year, two or more months on antibiotics with little effect, two or more pneumonias within a year, failure of an infant to gain weight or grow up normally, recurrent deep skin or organ abscesses, persistent thrush in the mouth or fungal infection on the skin, need for IV antibiotics, two or more deep-seated infections, including sepsis, or a family history of primary immunodeficiency. But the European Society for Immunodeficiency has helped us, and they've gone one step further to define six warning signs for adult primary immunodeficiency. These include four or more infections requiring antibiotics within a year, recurring infections or infection that requires prolonged antibiotic therapy, two or more severe bacterial infections such as osteomyelitis, meningitis, sepsis, or cellulitis, two or more radiologically proven pneumonias within three years, infections with unusual localization or an unusual pathogen, or certainly a history of primary immunodeficiency within the family. But do we really need a patient to go through this many infections before we would consider a young adult for evaluation for primary immunodeficiency? Let me show you some data to suggest otherwise. 
In a multi-center French study of 18 to 40 year old, otherwise well young adults who were hospitalized over a three year period with invasive infections due to encapsulated organisms. Um, and these infections were meningitis, osteomyelitis, uh, sepsis, pneumonia and sepsis. Um, so it, really pretty significant infections. And the patients um, were generally uh, having infections from strep pneumonia, group A strep, haemophilus influenzas, Neisseria meningitidis or Neisseria gonococcus. And if patients had a history of systemic predisposing comorbidities, such as cancer, diabetes, alcohol abuse, presence of other localizing factors like cigarette smoking or an underlying lung problem um, like cystic fibrosis, if they'd been on immunosuppressives, if they had a uh, history of um, pregnancy, if it was a hospital acquired infection, or certainly if they were known to have primary immunodeficiency, those, those patients were all excluded from this study. So in this study, the, the patients were included 38 patients. It was a first infection in 36 of them. 27 had screening for primary immunodeficiency. And in seven of these patients, or 19% of the cohort, primary immunodeficiency was confirmed. And the two most common, uh, or the two immunodeficiencies that were found were either antibody deficiency or a complement deficiency. There are further data to support this. The, this is a more recent publication from uh, 2019 by the IDSA. And they found that in, eight, again, 18 to 40 year olds who were admitted with an invasive bacterial infection to the hospital, 23% were readmitted and 7% died within two years of the first infect admission. In this additional study by Bedoli et al, um, they looked at another group of patients who had their evaluation for primary immunodeficiency after a first hospitalization for invasive infection. What they found in the 34 patients that they studied was uh, that in uh, eight of them, they were able to find in primary immunodeficiency, either in the form of an antibody deficiency, a combined immunodeficiency, or complement defect. The approach that they took was to make sure that these patients had evaluation at eight, eight weeks after discharge so that there wouldn't be confounding factors, particularly with regard to those complement uh, evaluations. From, their, from them being convalescent. Um, so the evaluations, as you can see here, included a CBC with differential and smear, IgG levels, as well as IgG subclasses, a total IgM and IgA, evaluation of the complement system by the classical and alternative pathways, and quantification of C3 and C4. They did phenotyping of TB and NK cells, they looked for specific antibody responses to diphtheria, tetanus, and pneumococcus, and assessed for HIV serology. So this cohort included uh, patients where the median age was 40 and a half years, and they, these were the, set, the, the infections that we saw. And as I mentioned, this was the first infection in 91% of them. So again, we found almost uh, the same percentage that almost 20% of the patients who had the evaluation were found to actually have a primary immunodeficiency after first infection, not waiting for that second infection. So first pearl to take home, you don't need to have two severe infections in an otherwise healthy young adult to start looking for primary immunodeficiency with this very simil simple evaluation that should be done sometime after discharge, not during the convalescent period. Increasingly, it's important to realize that primary immunodeficiency is being diagnosed in patients who are presenting with non-infectious phenotypes. But in pediatrics, we see significant differences in, in that uh, pediatric patients with autoimmune disease have a much higher rate of finding primary immunodeficiency than a control population. There's actually not a significant difference in terms of lymphoproliferative disease in either adult or pediatric patients. When we look to atopy, however, in pediatric patients, 
healthy controls actually have more HOP than patients with primary immunodeficiency. But this is switched in young adults. And so if we have young adults with challenging con to control atopic conditions, primary immunodeficiency should be considered as part of the differential uh, diagnosis for why this may be. So since common variable immunodeficiency is the most common primary immunodeficiency we see in adults, it's important to consider this diagnostic criteria. And the incidence is about one in 25,000. So what are the clinical diagnostic criteria? At least one of the following, increased susceptibility to infection, autoimmune manifestations, granulomatous disease, unexplained clonal lymphoproliferation, or an affected family member with known antibody deficiency. And the patient is well beyond the fourth year of life, not a problem for the group that we're talking about today. And we've excluded secondary causes of hypogammaglobulinemia, which is more common to be a, a, a consideration in young adults. So what do we wanna make sure we're thinking about in terms of secondary hypogammaglobulinemia? Protein lose, loss, chronic steroid use, B cell directed immunosuppression, such as monoclonals or CART. And um, I just want to mention here that, that, I, that uh, this is an initiative that we are doing at our center, and I'm sure others do. But uh, just to remind, it's always useful to check IgG, IgA, and IgM levels before starting any of these therapies, um, such as rituximab, um, and to monitor where those levels go during therapy. It can be beneficial to give patients a Pneumovax vaccine to boost their protection before starting therapy. And with regard to rituximab uh, in particular, because this is probably the most common of the anti-CD19 agents, realize that about a quarter will develop hypogam during therapy and the timing to recovery can be very variable and it can be persistent. And so when it's persistent, Further immunologic evaluation to consider uh, that this was that their autoimmune phenomena was due to actually underlying common variable immunodeficiency becomes important. Getting back to those diagnostic criteria for CVID, um, the lab criteria, once you've met the clinical criteria, as we know, include a marked decrease of IgG measured at least twice and less than two standard deviations of normal for age a marked decrease of IgA with or without low IgM levels, and having a poor antibody response to vaccines or absent hemagglutinins or low switched memory B cells, and no evidence of profound T cell deficiency, which would then, because if that were present, that would then make us think more that this isn't just common variable immunodeficiency, but may uh, be uh, indicative of a combined T cell and B cell deficiency. So what are the different diagnostic criteria for combined immunodeficiency? Well, in these patients, there's typically one of the following clinical presentations, at least one severe infection requiring hospitalization, one manifestation of autoimmune dysregulation, such as autoimmunity, inflammatory bowel disease, severe eczema, lymphoproliferation or granuloma, malignancy, or an affected member. In combined immunodeficiency, two of four T cell criteria must be fulfilled, um, which would include reduced CD3, CD4, or CD8 cells, reduced naive T cells or naive CD8 cells, elevated gamma delta cells, or reduced proliferation to mitogen or T cell receptor directed stimulation. And it's important to be sure that we uh, excluded HIV in this cohort. So where do we see the overlap and how can we tease apart these populations of common variable immunodeficiency versus combined immunodeficiency? So this is where looking at some of the registry data and considering genetic testing can be helpful. So this uh, was a nice publication uh, from the ECID data um, about two years ago in Jackie in practice. Um, and this was a study of uh, 1,704 CVID patients who were entered into the registry as having common variable immunodeficiency. There were 27% um, of the children who were in, 
you know, uh, initially diagnosed as having a uh, common variable immunodeficiency, 27% uh, of them were reclassified um, and 8% um, of adults were reclassified um, to a different diagnosis. So the majority of adults maintained um, a, a CVID diagnosis um, or, or were diagnosed um, uh, with a, you know, an antibody deficiency. Um, adult CVID patients were more frequently diagnosed with bronchitis, arthritis, depression, and fatigue. Um, the, there were also more autoimmunity, lymphoma, and malignancy in adults, but this was not statistically significant. And the, the median um, immunoglobulin levels and lymphocyte subsets didn't differ substantially between the um, two groups. Um, so when we looked at the complications of the infections and the comorbid conditions categorically in this study, um, there really weren't a lot of differences between the pediatric and adult onset CVID patients. But what was helpful was that when the criteria were strictly applied, um, patients were able to be reclassified. And when genetic testing was used, more of the adults were, be, were shifted toward a genetic diagnosis, um, whereas many of the uh, children were shifted toward um, an unclassified antibody deficiency. And so this is pearl number two, to still consider use of genetic testing in adult patients with um, symptoms concerning for CVID and certainly common variable immunodeficiency. To round out our discussion of antibody deficiencies and cellular defects, I'd be remiss not to mention Good syndrome. Um, while this is not as common, the presentation uh, in young, young adults, it is seen in middle to late middle age adults and typically um, is um, found in about one in 500,000 patients. Um, so it's much less common than CVID or CID. The, the features of Good syndrome include thymoma. There's not a familial association. And these patients have increased susceptibility to invasive bacterial infections, fungal infections, and viral infections. They will experience autoimmunity and have absent B cells with hypogammaglobulinemia. And it's important to realize here that uh, you know, this median age at onset for this cohort is uh, you know, with Good syndrome is 56, whereas the median age for patients diagnosed with either B negative CVID or CVID overall is more in the early 20s. Um, although the most common ages of evaluation are actually um, older. Uh, than the median age at diagnosis, or onset of symptoms, I should say. So it just kind of proving that it takes this diagnostic odyssey, and it would probably help both populations uh, for us to be considering the diagnosis of primary immunodeficiency sooner. It's also important to realize that in these cohorts, the prognosis for patients with Good syndrome, unfortunately, if we follow this dotted line, is much worse than uh, those with either B negative CVID or uh, B positive um, CVID. And this is talking about switched memory B cells, of course, um, when you look at uh, survival to 20 years after uh, diagnosis. Um, in terms of the autoimmunity seen in Good syndrome, in a uh, large French uh, case series, the most common was oral lichen planus, um, seen in 48% of patients who also had chronic diarrhea, a pure red cell aplasia in 33%, and neutropenia in 25%. And in, also, these autoimmune features did not always resolve with resection of their thymoma. What about selective IgA deficiency? We all think of this as being uh, the most common primary immunodeficiency. Um, about 25 to 50% of selective IgA patients are recognized by evaluation of their allergic diseases, um, whereas 25 um, to 32% of patients are affected with some autoimmune condition, and that is higher in the adult po um, population of selective IgA patients. So the most common uh, immunodeficients that we see are idiopathic 
um, thrombocytic penic purpura, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Graves disease, late onset diabetes, thyroid thyroiditis, celiac disease, IBD, or systemic lupus. Um, and uh, if we look here, um, we can see that the um, prevalence, although variable by ethnicity, in some case reports is as high as one in 142 of a population study. Um, infections are more likely in patients who have concurrent IgG2 subclass deficiency. So in those patients who have a marked reduction in uh, IgA, it is important to also look at IgG and IgM and to be sure to assess antibody response to vaccine uh, to be sure we're not uh, just touching the tip of the iceberg of CVID. Um, and then about a quarter of the cases are familiar here, familial here. And to round out our um, discussion of susceptibility to uh, severe bacterial infection, um, I wanted to also touch on complement deficiency. Um, so early defects uh, in complement, um, in particular C1, C2, and C4, as we know, are associated with uh, susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. This is most profound actually in C3 due to impact on both the classical and alternative pathways coming together at that point. But these populations are more commonly diagnosed in childhood uh, because of the, these, uh, you know, the, the early significance and the fact that there is some redundancy that will develop as the humoral immune system uh, grows better. Um, recurrent systemic infections though with uh, encapsulated organism is associated with a rate of complement deficiency of 11%. Um, and as I've previously mentioned, young adults with a first invasive bacterial infection, 19% had immunodeficiency, and in this cohort, 10% were found to have a complement deficiency. It's important to realize, though, that many of those were actually defects in the late pathway of C5 through C9, um, causing increased susceptibility to Neisseria, either disseminated my, uh, Neisseria infections or Neisseria meningitis. Uh, of the late defects. Um, defects in C9 are actually the most common that we uh, see associated. Um, and the prevalence of um, com uh, complement deficiency among patients who have had a single episode of meningococcal sepsis has varied in um, case cohorts from 5 to 15 percent. The prevalence can be seen, um, though, to be as high as 40 percent in patients who have recurrent meningococcal sepsis um, or in patients with infection from an uncommon serotype or a positive family history of meningococcal systemic infections. And so for this reason, if you find a one family member with a terminal complement deficiency, it is critically important to then screen their first degree relatives uh, to capture this diagnosis early so that uh, preventative measures can be taken. I want to also touch on GABA2 deficiency. Um, so the, these are um, un, the, the mutations in GABA2 deficiency may first present with warts or lymphedema, um, but then will commonly um, progress um, to having disseminated non tubercular mycobacterial infections, then later pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and then uh, kind of the cardinal feature of this disease are patients then developing cytopenias, myelodysplastic syndromes, and AML. Um, and the mutations and, oops, sorry, the mutations in the hematopoietic and endothelial uh, transcription factor of GABA2 have been associated with five different clinical symptom, syndromes. Um, so it might be important to just to, list those out so you're aware of those kind of overlapping descriptors that go with this monogenic form of immunodeficiency. Um, so GATA2 has been associated with patients with the monomax syndrome of monocytopenia with NTM infections. 
in DCML or dendritic cell monocyte and lymphoid cell deficiency. In Emberger syndrome, patients with lymphedema coupled with myelodysplasia. In families with familial MDS or acute myelogenic leukemias or in classical NK cell deficiency. It's also important to realize that the lag from identification of the presenting symptoms of warts or lymphedema to the development of pulmonary alveolar prognosis or leukemia or myelodysplasia can take many years to decades. And so then it can be hard to connect these dots. So uh, given this very variable set of uh, presenting symptoms and the fact that this is one of those diagnoses that can present in young adulthood, either with the warts or with falling cytopenias, um, it's important to consider genetic testing early in these patients. And if a genetic diagnosis is found to similar to complement deficiencies, also test all first degree relatives. So where might we find these patients? Well, certainly we know they, they may have infectious diseases. So what kind of infectious diseases might prompt us uh, to think about primary immunodeficiency in a young adult? Well, the ones that we've been mentioning, patients with severe, difficult to child, uh, control warts, patients with recurrent uh, invasive bacterial infections, particularly from encapsulated organisms um, or from um, meningitis, from Neisseria meningitidis. Um, and less commonly seen, but certainly if a patient developed pneumonia due to pneumocystis, that can also be seen in a late onset of combined immunodeficiency. And then finally, disseminated mycobacterial disease, as I just described, can be seen in those patients with GATA2 deficiency. What about for our gastroenterology colleagues? What, what primary immunodeficiencies might be seen in patients commonly evaluated in their clinics? Well, in patients who are having difficulty with um, chronic diarrhea, or chronic giardiasis, we would wanna consider antibody deficiency or combined immunodeficiency. If we have patients with persistent candidiasis, consideration of combined immunodeficiency as well as aphicid, which I did not um, specifically highlight, but is also more commonly diagnosed in young adults, can be a more common diagnosis found in the GI clinic than in others. In the dermatology clinics, um, patients with severe and persistent warts, we want to think about GATA2 deficiency early, uh, as well as um, patients with disseminated herpes infection, we'd want to think about combined immunodeficiencies or uh, WIM syndrome, which can also have a latent onset. In the hematology clinic, um, patients who are presenting with autoimmune cytopenias, either anemia, thrombocytopenia, or neutropenia, this can be the first sign of common variable immunodeficiency uh, and, and should prompt an evaluation in young adults for primary immunodeficiency. And then finally, in the pulmonary clinic, um, we would want to think about patients who are having recurrent pneumonias or recurrent sinusitis. Um, due to um, extracellular bacteria or patients who are having uh, severe lung infections such as lung abscesses or pneumocystis, similar to what we mentioned for the our infectious disease colleagues. So I'd like to close with a case presentation of a young man, 23 years old, with a history of recurrent episodes of sinusitis and otitis that have gotten worse over the last two to three years. He says he coughs all winter long. He does have a history of allergic disease with sensitization to trees, dust mite, and cat, but he's otherwise pretty healthy. But he's been taking all of these medicines for his allergies for a pretty long time, and they don't seem to be working as well anymore. He comes to the ER with a persistent productive cough for a week, wheezing and crackles in the left lower lobe. He's hypoxic and has fever to 39. He's admitted to the hospital and develops a strep pneumonia bacteremia. So this is our first serious infection. What do you think we should do for this young man? Should we get him some COVID testing? Should we check a CBC and immunoglobulin levels while he's inpatient? What about if we do the immunoglobulin levels and titers in a CH50 while he's inpatient? 
or should we do a CBC, the titers, and the complement assessment a few weeks after his hospitalization while he's an outpatient? If you remember in that study from 2019, they waited about eight weeks before doing the assessment to avoid any complicating factors of the data being challenging to interpret in the convalescent period. So I would argue that we should select Optin D. And once the patient has recovered from this acute illness, do a, a thorough assessment of the humoral immune system as well as the complement system. This is what we find. He has a normal age 50, CH50. He has a slightly low IgG um, as well as a slightly low IgA and normal IgM. He's got uh, still a little bit of a left shift to his white blood cell count. Um, and his tetanus titer is protective, his diphtheria titer is protective, but none of these pneumococcal titers um, would be considered uh, protective, save for 19F and uh, 5. So we make a recommendation for this patient to get the pneumovax. And he responded beautifully. Uh, four weeks later, he had a rip-roaring response. However, he comes back to immunology clinic a year later. He's still having persistent recurrent sinopulmonary infections, but thankfully hasn't been readmitted. At that point, when he's 24 years old, we repeat his labs and his IgG has fallen to 350. The IgA has fallen to 18 and the IgM is relatively stable at 77. Tetanus and diphtheria are relatively stable, but he's now down to only having 14 a uh, seven out of 14 protective pneumococcal titers. So 50% protective. Based on our diagnostic criteria, would we consider him to have common variable immunodeficiency, specific antibody deficiency, a steroid induced typogam or a gamma globulinemia? I hope it, and I assume it's pretty obvious to everyone that this diagnosis is consistent with common variable immunodeficiency. So in summary, primary immunodeficiency is not just an early in life diagnosis. The most common immunodeficiencies in adults are CVID, common uh, combined immunodeficiency, complement defects, and good syndrome, although that is later onset than others. If you have complex young adults with multiple subspecialty providers, consider primary immunodeficiency. Don't wait. Consider primary immunodeficiency, even if there's only one invasive infection, you could save somebody's life. And have a low threshold for genetic testing if you find functional abnormalities. That patient that you thought had CVID may be reclassified into combined immunodeficiency, a GATA2 defect, or others. Thank you for your attention, and I will uh, take some questions at this time. Thank you.